right, champions. We're back to our natural habitat and our usual camera angle. So let's have a look at this thing up close. We'll see what went wrong and what I did to address it. So this is our main high tension supply here. It's going through a bridge rectifier. It's got a bleeder resist to the ground and your first uh, filter cap or reservoir cap, you could say, because it's before the standby switch. It seems to be the common vernacular. There's also your bias supply, which is pulling AC from there and it is capacitively coupling it via that uh, cap that was short and then that is providing um, a direct path to ground direct short to ground through that diode because it is no longer a capacitor it's a straight wire so it's like a direct short straight to ground so check that diode and it's fine um, we'll run it up, give it some juice and just check that everything's okay. And if it's all good, we'll give it a listen and see what's going on. Well, they did use belt and valve sockets on this model, so that's good. Um, they didn't save the wrong two pennies there. So there's our new happy little C37 down there, ready to supply the bias supply without shorting to ground like the last one, hopefully. So now I've just got to repair that one standoff, which I removed. Um, stripped off uh, well the screw actually I'll just find a suitable screw and uh, new nut and lock washer for that just to replace the one that snapped the uh, lock tight was able to be cleaned off the other one so they were able to be reused without being you know way too stiff and I also replaced that dropper R46 um, with a 470 ohm uh, as the existing one top and bottom two 1k resistors was a little bit ridiculous so I'll put a nice lightweight one in there v-shape with uh, the crimp legs so it, it uh, stands up off the board without putting the force onto the uh, onto the solder pads themselves right so everything's reinstalled reconnected the valves are in uh, ready to fire it up on the variac I've confirmed that that short has been removed because uh, it was occurring with the standby switch off because that bias draws from before the standby switch um, and that capacitor that had failed uh, was before the standby switch. So I've confirmed that that's gone now. So chances are high that everything's hunky-dory. The only thing I'm concerned about now, or the main thing I'm concerned about is, uh, does the reverb tank work? And is that valve that has the writing gone? Was it just wiped off or did it come off because it, the valve had overheated because there's some, some sort of supply issue? There was a lot of cracked solder joints on this board. So there's quite a possibility that that, that might have overheated due to a lack of uh, a lack of bias supply to that, that pin of that valve. Hopefully it hasn't permanently damaged the valve and he can get out of this repair without having to buy a new match pair. So um, at the moment with the price of valves, um, whether or not you need a new set can be the difference between a repair uh, quote being approved and being rejected. Uh, you're free to source your own valves, that's fine. Um, I can't give you any warranty on anything that I haven't purchased. And even then the warranty's like 90 days, so um, we do our best to keep everyone happy, but <sighs> simple fact is they're expensive at the moment and I can't be uh, doing business without passing that cost on. So here's a little test adapter I made up specifically for amps like this that just have uh, no speaker jack. They just got the, the uh, quick connect terminals coming out of a grommet on the amp chassis. So that's just a uh, female inline jack socket. And then I've got two spade connectors crimped onto the end of that wire. And I've just got some heat shrink on there that's not shrunk. And I just like to leave that on there and just slide them over the connectors so they're not short against anything during testing. And that's a nice quick little way to interface and then I just plug into either a dummy load for taking measurements or I or long-term burning tests or I plug into the speaker cabinet just to check that everything's sounding okay and the test cabinet under the bench. Okay, so I've got the uh, meters set across the two sides of the primary and the output transformer to measure the resistance at the moment. We've got 71.7 ohms and 103.3 ohms. Bit of a mismatch, but it's not the end of the world because we're looking at DC resistances here, static DC resistance. Uh, we are more concerned that the primary impedance is correct. Uh, and as far as AC and DC are concerned, 
DC just sees the length of wire, AC sees a bunch of coils. Um, if uh, it was way out, like one was like one off ten percent of the other, we'd probably have a fault or shorter turns or something dramatic. But um, generally, about thirty percent, um, we're probably fine. It's a turns ratio thing as far as the AC signal is concerned, where it's a length of wire as far as the DC is concerned. So the inner turns will be shorter length, so lower DC resistance. The outer turns will have a larger circumference, so therefore there'll be longer length of copper as far as the DC is concerned, but the turns ratio is still the same. So to the AC, it's more or less balanced. So guys get hung up over that all the time, think they've got to fault the output transformer and replace the bastard for no reason. It's not a problem. Um, we're just m taking the two measurements here. So we, when we use the output transformer as a resistor in series with the anode, we can calculate the voltage drop across that resistor, resistor being the transformer primaries, and we can calculate how much DC current the output uh, valves are drawing. And then we can, with respect to the plate to cathode voltage, we can determine how much power the uh, the valves dissipating and then we can use that figure in relation to the published data sheet uh, maximum power dissipation allowable for that tube valve and we can calculate the percentage of uh, that maximum bias that the, the valve is dissipating and that's what the quoted uh, bias level is in watts uh, a percentage of the maximum so when people go 60 70 50 percent they're talking about how many watts uh, in comparison to the maximum power dissipation on the data sheet. So generally we refer to it as percentages. Right, so to calculate uh, the bias we're trying to hit, instead of firing it up and taking a measurement and then seeing where that sits, we'll work our way backwards. So let's propose for a moment that this voltage here is about what it is, 390 volts DC. That's the B plus, so that goes via the standby switch up to the center tap of the output transformer and supplies the plates of either valve. We're measuring the voltage drop across here, but it'll be in the order of like two, one to two volts. So we can sort of disregard that to get our ballpark figure for the plate voltage uh, that will be present on pin three of each socket. Uh, so we'll note that down and use that as our starting point yeah yeah i know math time it sucks but sometimes you got to do it <laughs> so we've measured the resistance of each side from uh brown to red and from blue to red so red's the uh the b plus brown and blue are the plate connections for either valve and we're assuming 390 volt anode to cathode um that's quoted on the schematic because we haven't fired this thing up yet so we'll just assume that's right and uh we're going off the data sheet maximum 23 watts in pentode mode of the 5881 which is what this is loaded with uh the 6l6 would be 30 watts uh sorry 6l6 gc would be 30 watts 6l6 g is same as 5881 if not elf by a watt 24 or something can't remember anyway we're off track so um 23 watts so we want Say let's start at a starting point of 60% bias, right? So 23 watts times 0.6 or 60% of 23 watts equals 13.8 watts. So that's what we're aiming for. We want each valve to be idle dissipating 13.8 watts. Um, so that's per valve. Uh, so we'll divide that by the 390 volts anode to cathode that we're assuming is correct. And that gives us 35 uh, milliamps, so 0. Point, we've got to use amps in this equation. Um, so 0 0.035 amps, so that's 35 milliamps for, per valve. And you multiply that to get the voltage drop. So you multiply that on this side by 71.7 .7 and on this side by 103.3. So to hit that bias point uh, on the brown to red side, we'll be looking for 2.51 volt drop across the that side of the pr primary of the output transformer. And on the other side, for the other valve, we'll be aiming for 3.616. So these voltages will be different. And if those voltages come up at that or near that, that means the valves are pretty well matched, regardless of the 
voltage being different because we're different measuring across two different DC resistances. So we're not looking for the same number. If we had the same number on both sides, the valves wouldn't be matched. They'd be pretty far out. So these are the voltages that adjusting the trim pot will be aiming for to hit 60%, assuming that we've got 390 volts anode to cathode. You notice there's a K there. That's the symbol for cathode. Starts with a C when you write it. K, Greek letters, all that kind of bullshit. I don't know. Look into it. I think cathode means down way, anode means up way, or vice versa. I don't know. Whatever. Who cares? <laughs> all right, so we've got the meters flashed up on uh, just volts DC. We've got the variac plugged in. We've got uh, two condoms on. Um, I've dialed zero, zero, and when I die, I'll dial zero. Um, and <laughs> we're going to fire it up and have a look. I've got the speaker plugged in. We've got some signal going in at one kilohertz, reasonably low level, so we don't deafen ourselves or you. Um, so let's fire it up. We'll just confirm that there's no crazy current draw for starters. And then if it's all looking good, we'll bring the variac up slowly. And if we're approaching operating voltage without any issue, we'll give it the full mains voltage. But first, we'll give it bugger all of that, probably 10% of the mains. And we'll just check that we've got bias supply on all the relevant pins and that all our plate connections are receiving HT. We've got both the standby and the power switch on. I'll give you a look at the meter, why not? So these are our two uh, primaries, that side and that side on the output transformer. And this is the one that I'm probing about with. I don't like just sticking the meter through the screw hole, I was almost did it then just quickly, but it's a cage nut, it's not a great connection. You think there's something wrong, don't be second guessing your connections. Get a good connection, one less thing to concern yourself with. And for that, got a nice heavy duty alligator clip there and a banana. A banana going into the ground there, so we've got a nice solid connection. Right, so I've Flick the test meter or the probing meter to uh, AC. Turn the variac all the way down, turn it on. We'll measure the, uh, the primary. If I can get my probe in there. All right, so we've got 4.7 volts AC. Let's bring that up to about 24, so we should have roughly 10% of everything. We're not seeing any jumps in the current consumption from the wall meter there, the watt meter. So looks like, like our short has gone bye-bye. We'll flick the meter over to DC and we'll just check a few points. So that's the plate supply there, 42 volts DC. The screen should be about the same. Yeah, 42 volts, that's on one. On the other, 42 volts. 42 volts, sweet. My probe came off there. Got to watch that. Got minus 4.3. Keep slipping off. Minus 4.3 on the grid uh, control grid. That's good. We've got buy supply. What we'll do is we'll take that most negative, just to be on the safe side, since we are just establishing what's what. It's a trim pot down there. I keep slipping off that friggin' thing because I haven't had enough coffee. All right, so we'll take that counterclockwise all the way and that's the most negative, so that will be the coolest bias. All right, so we'll go to the preamp valves. Let's check they've all got plate supply, 42, 42, yep, 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 yep. Now you generally don't need a schematic to do this stuff, you can just test it. All right, so we'll click over to AC. Just check that we've got reasonably balanced heaters, even though we're not running anywhere near the uh, the actual voltage. Yep, they're good. The preamp valves. Good. 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 And good. All right, champions, it's go time. Both switches on. Signal going in, speaker connected, 
and we've got the meters on the primaries and we've got a meter here in case we want to probe around if anything's a bit sus so we'll lift up the voltage just click that to AC for the moment just monitor the voltage going into it only drawing 10 watts of 50 volts before it would have been drawing about 100 watts there so that's that shorts removed coming up slowly 15 watts no smoke <laughs> 100 volts AC no dramatic increases in current no conduction happening yet you hear the relays click 20 watts at 130 starting to get signal 170 volts pretty crackly pots but I think they'll clean up okay I didn't clean them up yet because I just wanted to see what they're like. No master volume yet because we're on the other channel. Click that over and turn that down a bit or we'll deafen ourselves. Alright, master's working. It's a bit crackly too. Uh, so let's give that full mains. Oh, let's just do it on the variac, eh? <clears throat> well, we're here. Come up to 240 volts. It's usually more like 250 around here, but. Sweet. We're sitting at 1.1, 1.5 on one side. Sorry, 1. Point, say 3, 1.7 on the other side, 1.8. Still going up a bit. Let that settle. We'll grab our measurements again, our target measurements, and we'll aim for them. And we'll check the B plus. We'll flick over to DC. <clears throat> Got 418, so significantly higher than the quoted measurement. So we'll be aiming a bit lower than those. Uh, DC uh, voltages across the primary that we we aim for before so this often happens um, a lot of amp manufacturers will design the amp for 220 volts or 230 volts and then they'll just put a sticker on it saying 240 uh, we're often 250 and it's a direct ratio the input and the output of the power transformer so of course if you've got higher uh, mains you're gonna have higher B plus it's a ratio so, not the end of the world here, because we've got five eight eight ones. they can handle it, but it often happens in amps that have EL84s, and it pushes them like 30% higher than their maximum rate of plate voltage, which isn't good for the lifetime of the valve. So I'll bring the uh, bias up a touch. We won't go as far as our target, target voltages, but we'll push closer to them, just so the mains, uh, the, the B plus will sag down a little bit, and we'll get a sense of how stiff that supply is. That's reacting very slow to the bias adjustment, so probably a pretty large cap on the bias supply. There's almost no current draw from the bias supply, so there's no need to have a big cap. Uh, and what's that got? 47 microfarads, that's why it's a bit slow to react to the pop movement. So you want to go slow and wait for it to stabilize. So we're already at 3.7 on the uh, blue to red side. We're aiming it for 3.6 there. So I think we've got a bit of a bit mismatch in these valves. So I might land at two two volts on the left hand there, three point two on the right, and we'll check that B plus and see how much it's moved. All right, so four fourteens come down a little bit, not much. So we'll recalculate that with the given voltages and aim for sixty percent plus minus. It looks like probably plus minus at least five percent, given the mismatch of these outputs now again 
that voltage being mismatched doesn't mean the valves are mismatched, but our calculations will show how far out they actually are. Well, I've got it up and warm, out and angry. We'll just um, have a quick play through it, see what it sounds like. We know it's giving signal with the signal generator. We'll have a play with the old workshop strap. We're drawing 75 watts from the mains in idle state. Also check that the reverb's working. I've got the tank plugged in there on the bench under the meters there. So we've got reverb. There was a funny distortion there when I first turned it up, but I think that was just the pot dirtiness. Yeah, we give the pots a clean, see how they go. I think they're gonna clean up okay. Okay, that's almost like a six second decay. Maybe not that long, more like four or five. That's maxed out. I'll plug it in later and have a play through the mic. Be super professional. We've got the old uh, corroded effects loop jack issue hear that what did i say about secondary issues every time all right oh it works fine just don't worry about it <laughs> it's all right this customer is good but you get them i think that'll clean up okay though because the contacts don't look really corroded often they're like really tarnished uh, i think we might be able to just run some like just paper through the two contact, um, you know, where the contacts meet. So what it is, it's the normaling jack. So the jack bypasses the effects loop when nothing's plugged in. It's like grabbing a, a plug, uh, sorry, a patch lead and going from the line out to the line in. The jacks do that internally when nothing's plugged in. When you pull them out, the jack's supposed to close and loop the line out to the line in. So that cuts off from the preamp to the power amp. A quick way I'll let you in on a secret here, champions. A quick way to establish if you're having a problem, like no signal or a lot of hum or something, um, a lot of noise, a quick way to establish if the problem's coming from the preamp or the power amp is plug your guitar in the line in or the effects return. It's called different stuff on different amps, but it's the same thing. So on the Hot Rod series, it'll say preamp out, power amp in. That's an effects loop. It cuts the signal off between the preamp and the power amp. If you, I forget which one it is, but if you plug in one of them, it breaks the signal chain. So you can isolate, uh, say you've got a lot of hum, just plug a jack into the, the one that cuts them off. And if the hum stops, you've got hum coming from the preamp. If you've got no signal and you plug in, you plugged into the power amp return or the effects return, and you suddenly can hear your guitar, that means the problem's cutting off the signal before that point. If there's still no signal, chances are it's a problem either in the whole amp, the power supply, or in the output stage. There you go. Bill's in the mail for that advice. All right, so before we go cleaning the pots and stuff, we'll just check for microphonics, anything else that we can address. We just want to turn this off, um, address everything, try and hit them all, and then fire it up and leave it under test for a long time so we'll test for microphonics and I'll calculate where we want these to sit given the higher plate voltage than expected we've got some fluctuating noise happening there I think the valve sockets and pins need a bit more of a clean no dramatic microphonics that's cranked Some thunderstormy sort of rushing water noises happening. I think it's the pins on that first valve. So here's how I clean the contacts if they're not too bad on a normal jack. 
Um, that's literally a piece of a manila folder, just soaked in alcohol, and um, just like me. <laughs> and uh, you put it under the contacts, spring contacts, gently lift the contacts, slide it under there, pull it out maybe two or three times. That just gets the schmoo off the uh, contacts without affecting the plating because it's non-abrasive. Um, if it's worse than that, you might try maybe 2,000 grit. I wouldn't go any more coarser than that. Uh, 2,000 grit wet and dry and just do it like once or twice if you fold it over on itself so it hits both contacts at once or if you can only get a single layer in there, just do it one, one way, once the other. Uh, any more than that, you'll take off the protective plating and then the base metal will start to corrode. The, the base metal that the plating's there to protect. Um, then it might be okay for a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, and then it'll start failing again. And if, if that's within the warranty period, of course you've got to fix it yourself. If it's outside the warranty period, um, the customer will have to deal with it and that's not very uh, convenient for them. Alrighty, so with us sitting at 415 volts as we measured, as opposed to our 390 we derived from the schematic, We've got more of a picture of what's going on. Uh, we're aiming for 33 milliamps, not 35, as we showed up here. So uh, that at 60% would result in a 2.38 volt drop and a 3.41 volt drop on the other side of the transformer. For a 50%, there are the voltages there. So we'll probably, we might aim for the 50, see how we go there. If there's a lot of crossover distortion, then we might come up to the 60. We'll see what the uh, feedback network does with the crossover distortion. All right, so we've given it full mains now. I'm not regulated to 240 by the Variac. Um, forgive my neighbor for having uh, the cure absolutely cranked. If you can hear the bass line in the background there, I'll put a <laughs> high pass filter on that. So we were aiming for one point uh, nine, not well, say two volts for fifty percent on one on this side, and then two point eight volts on this side. So that's given a anode to cathode voltage of four fifteen volts. So what is it? Four thirty. So we're higher on the unregulated mains because we are sitting at today two hundred forty eight volts. Doesn't look like 220 to me, does it? So that's the reality of the modern electrical network. Uh, often the voltages overshoot. Some areas they are on the verge of brownout. Here they tend to be high pretty much all the time. So taking into account that and plate voltage of, what was it, 430? Well, check the ripple well we're there. 1.4 volts on the B plus, that's very low. Uh, 400 and say 430 volts DC so that's what we'll factor in so for 60% that brings us to what have we got 2.3 volts on the left and 3.3 volts on the right so let's see how closely they match up not perfect but good enough for rock and roll so I've let it rest for a while and we're sitting at about 60% on one side and about 50% on the other. So not a great match, but it is an instrument amplifier, not a uh, not a hi-fi. So should be fine. Uh, if the customer wants, we can offer them a new set of valves, but they do the job. So I'll give it a little bit of uh, signal again, just the sine wave. I'll drop it down to 400-ish hertz so it doesn't sound so piercing. Well, the crackling's gone after cleaning those pots. So that's good, all the pots are good. All right, so we'll just have a quick play. So it seems to be going for that uh, Blues Deluxe, um, Hot Rod Deluxe, Classic 30 type of uh, market where the overdrive is pretty smooth via EQ. Uh, it's rolled the top off a bit and rolled the bottom off a bit as well, sort of very mid bass distortion. Uh, reasonable amounts of gain but not much top end to the overdrive channel. You can tell there, there's probably a bit of snubbing happening there. Um, 
you know, they've all got pretty usable tones uh, in the right hands. The reverb on this is like way, way more in your face than, than either the Classic 30 or the, the Deluxe series or Blues series. Um, yeah, they're pretty cool amps. Um, they've got the same shortcomings as everything else. At least they don't have IC caps. They've got a few uh, few niche cons in there, which is good to see. And some uh, pretty decent quality components. Uh, but yeah, the same old issues with a very flimsy single-sided board. So yeah. So here's the pilot light. I removed the, uh, the tip of it's broken off. Someone's glued it on in the past. The lamp's blown and the spade connector's uh, broken off. So I got on to Yamaha Australia, who is the distributor for Ampeg, and they were kind enough to send me a couple of links to some possible substitute lamps and uh, LED uh, housings, but the actual uh, unit itself is no longer available. He also sent me a schematic, so it was very nice. Uh, Yamaha are a joy of a company company to deal with, and I don't mean that sarcastically like I normally when I say that. <laughs> they are proper uh, proper legends. So. Um, they did their best and uh, once again went above and beyond their call of duty to try and help me out but um but i'll probably make up an led with a integral resistor and i'll crimp on some uh new connectors just to go onto the existing spade connectors the standoffs on the uh on the circuit board all right so here's a little lighting loom we made up um we um that's uh led just little green bezel there little chrome bezel that's on everything and crimped on some connectors so it can plug into the existing um, spade connectors that are mounted on the board. That way no, no modification required, no dodgy wiring or anything. It's just another little plug-in equivalent of the factory unit, but just with parts that are available. And of course we've got the uh, series resistor to limit the current to the LED that's pulling off the heater supply. Well there's a new indicator LED with bezel. I reckon it looks pretty smart myself with all the chrome going on uh, and the best part of all it won't blow like an incandescent wheel so we won't need to replace it for a long time anyway now whatever you do when working on amps don't forget to wash your knob and give it a bit of a polish you know rude not to and of course what if restoration wouldn't be complete without a bit of the old day spa for the cabinet? Alright, so we've got the uh, signal jenny running into it. We've got some uh, dummy loads up there. We've got 8 ohms. And we're going into the old school tech, tri uh, tech scope. And we'll crank her up and see where she starts clipping. You can see the uh, RMS voltage up there. This is the fancy 2236 with a built in multimeter. The beautiful uh, fluorescent display there, which is still nice and bright. So we're showing the waveform there. We're coming up. We're starting to round off the tips at about 16, 16 volts RMS. So that's pushing around 32 watts ish into the into the load without trouble. Uh, could possibly put out some more with some new outputs, uh, output valves, but um, but that's sounding pretty healthy full volume so she's nice and happy give the reverb tank a bit of a uh, spritz with my favorite cleaning fluid <laughs> can be a bit aggressive sometimes so uh, save it for the vinyls and stuff works good on vinyl um, wouldn't use it on like a guitar finish or anything unless you dilute it first and the guitar is super manky yeah for vinyl for Tolex perfect See all the crap that it leaves behind on the bench. It looks like new. Bloody beauty, mate! So to clean the Tolex around the handle, it's often just easier to remove the handle altogether. That way you can give it a good scrubbing. Look at that. Mmm. Ah, much better.
have it champions another one done and dusted um i can't believe i haven't seen one of these before but we're in australia so uh what's common in the states isn't necessarily common here so been in the game about 10 years never never laid my hands on one so now we have and uh, no major surprises nothing new under the sun just same old same old problems with dry solder joints and stodgy components so <laughs> hope you enjoyed that one um uh, the sound samples are a little bit rushed. I've got to come up with some riffs and pre-record them or something so it's consistent with every video. Uh, I'm just making stuff up as I as I bloody play, you know. There's no consistency, but hopefully you get a vibe for how the thing feels and sounds. Um, uh, I've got to put a little... I want to put a little interface under the bench here. It's always good to go. Always mic'd up, ready to rock, because uh, it's a big pain in the ass at the moment. I've got to pull out the mixer and you know put the mic where it works for that particular amp and cab and plug it all in and blah 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 blah. Um, if we have a setup just always ready to rock, I'll be much more inclined to do videos because it's less uh, less labour intensive to do it. So anyway, hope you enjoyed that one and bloody catch you on the next one. Uh,